with yes. prayer tonight? Yes. Thank yes. you. I will. Yes. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together as a family. Thank you for leading us on this journey together to get closer to you. Because, oh, Father, we see you're coming soon. There are so many signs, so many things happening in the world every single day. In all of my life, I've never seen anything like it is today. And we're just grateful that you're protecting us and that in Ephesians, all the promises you have about the armor of God, about your angels, about being with us, strengthening us, even when we can't do it ourselves, you're there to do it for us. And we're grateful that, you're, that your love is always with us and your Holy Spirit is guiding each one of us closer and closer to you. And and be with us as a family that we will encourage one another, pray for one another, continue to do that. Please be with Cindy and help her to, to get well soon, heal her soon, and help her to be back that positive, wonderful person she is. Bless each one here and be with all of us that are traveling. My son is traveling in another hour. Bless him that he has a safe flight here. Be with all of those that couldn't be here, that they're safe and that you're watching over them too. And be with us as we as Ken leads us out and, and bless Ken and Cindy for continuing to have these meetings that we can meet together and learn and come closer to you. That's what it's all about, Father, and we're grateful. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Yes, indeed. That's what it's all about. It's getting closer and closer to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we have Judy and Vicki, Pat. We have uh, Margo and Jackie and Lori. Welcome, Lori. And Cindy's listening. So, um, so I sent out the email or had Cindy send it out with that list of 365 messianic prophecies that's an exciting document by the way took some time to, to kind of accumulate all that and, and bring it together but i'm telling you if you ever are at a place in your devotional life or you just want something really special and energizing to do go land anywhere on that 365 and look up that messianic prophecy about Jesus Christ from Genesis all the way to Malachi throughout the Old Testament we find Jesus is prophet he the birth and the life and the ministry and the resurrection of Jesus is prophesied it is incredible even in amazing places like the book of Job the book of Job and Cindy and I talked about it in our, in a devotional talk just amongst ourselves the other night, how powerful the prophetic uh, message of Job in Job chapter 19, I think it was, is uh, where he talks about how he has seen the Messiah and one day he's going to stand on the earth and that Job in his own flesh with his own eyes is going to see him. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And that's right in the middle of while everything was really bad for Job, really bad. He had lost it all. And he's still thinking about Jesus and he's sharing something that God gave to him. There's another beautiful messianic prophecy in the book of, of Ruth. And Ruth, and it's in chapter four of Ruth where uh, Boaz became her kinsman redeemer and literally became a type of Jesus to her, rescued her from imminent ruin, rescued her from poverty and from uh, just solitude and loneliness, you name it, Jesus, res uh, Jesus through Boaz rescued her. And <clears throat> of course, gave her this incredible privileged place to where she was in the line as one of the as a, a mother of Jesus Christ one day because David came from Ruth uh, Obed and Jesse David's father so that's how it went Obed Jesse David and then Jesus himself was a son of David it's just incredible. 
how the Bible tapestries woven together. And earlier in our conversation tonight, we were we were reminiscing about how God has woven so many of our lives together for decades here on earth and how precious it is to have the Holy Spirit putting us all together for his grand design and purpose. You know, I think about like with Jackie, I didn't know Jackie a few years ago, but through the Lord bringing me and Cindy together, I get to meet Jackie and it's just, it's, you know, we're family now. It's awesome. Just awesome. Living up here in Gold Hill. I didn't know Lori until we moved here to Gold Hill. So all of these connections are divine as I see them. And so if you, if you need some real inspiration one day, just go to any of those 365 Messianic prophecies. You'll notice a lot of them, of course, are found in the book of Psalms. Mm -hmm. And of course, David, being a great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus himself, um, and then having a heart for God like he did, a man after God's own heart, the Bible calls David, well, you can imagine the kind of messages, the messianic messages that were entrusted to David. And of course, being a superb musician, sometimes it's easy to forget that. He was so good. He was such a great harpist that he was in demand in the kingdom. Think about that. I mean, just think of a like a really renowned musician right now. That's kind of the way David was. It's pretty pretty cool and special to think about. But from his wonderful heart towards God and the music, um, he wrote so many great messages in song about Jesus coming and the Messiah. So you'll enjoy any of those Messianic prophecies. They are powerful. And then, of course, throughout the prophetic thread of the Old Testament, including amazing books, which we all went through together, the book of Daniel, Easily some of the most profound prophecies of Jesus are found in the book of Daniel. And Jesus loved Daniel. He called him dearly beloved. And um, so those are those are just real big gifts. But tonight we are going to come and land on only one messianic prophecy. It's going to be the very first one. Because this very first Messianic prophecy has amazing things to teach us and also is sets the stage for the whole Messianic revealing of Jesus Christ throughout the whole Old Testament. So I really wanted to go to, to the first prophecy of Jesus. So let me do a share screen and try to bring this up. Actually, going to have to come in here first. So, Ken, while you're doing that, I have to share. You were witnessing and didn't even know you were witnessing. So, yesterday when I was at school, I printed off um, the Bible verses that you sent me or sent us. And I put it at the corner of my desk, and it's the corner where the kids come up. So I had multiple kids, what's that, Mrs. Briley? What's that, Mrs. Briley? And I even had some kids go, can I have a copy of that? Awesome. So. Oh, that makes me feel fantastic. Thank <laughs> you. Let me get it up. Now I can come back over here to Zoom. You know, it. whatever we can do, right? Mm-hmm every opportunity we love it we love it okay can you see that okay yes all right uh, now better <laughs> now you can all right well Let's move forward then with our special study for tonight. And you can see that, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so these are these 11 studies to try to build the deepest possible personal relationship with Jesus. Here we are right in the middle. Number six. 
messianic prophecies, and I've shared all 365 of them. We're going to look at big number one. Now, this is a slide from a couple of weeks ago, but I still was impressed to put it back up of how Satan deceived a third of the angels that actually spent, we don't know how long, but perhaps thousands and millions of years in the presence of God. So imagine the power that he has over mere men that don't submit to the word of God. And I want to tie that to this, tonight's Bible lesson, because this strategy of his still works. We recall that Satan deceived our very first common mother, Eve, precious Eve. Have you ever thought about what that's going to be like for the very first time you and I get to hug our original mother, Eve? Oh, my. I, I, you know, we probably could just talk for hours what it might be like. It will be the most surreal and amazing experience. And you can only imagine, you know, because we all dearly love our mothers. And uh, we miss them greatly when they pass. It's they're not replaceable. Just imagine the connectedness we will all feel to finally be in the presence of our first mom and dad, our real first Adam and Eve. But then for her to realize, and of course, I know she spent her, you know, almost a thousand years here on earth that she lived just struggling with that choice that she made and having to come to Jesus over and over again and be assured she, it's okay, Eve, it's okay. We've got our plan. It's going to work. But because Satan deceived her with cunningly twisting the very words of God. We've talked about that here in our class, about how he just said, has God said you can't eat any of these trees? Well, that first of all, that, nope, that wasn't what he said at all. And then he says, you're really not going to die. Did he say you're going to die? You're not going to die. Your eyes are going to get opened. You're going to become like God's. Cunning twisting of the words of God. So imagine the power that he has over humans who will not submit to God and his words and seek the Holy Spirit for guidance into all truth. I'm amazed at how slyly and cunningly the enemy has distorted words and created all kinds of disconnects amongst denominations, Christians of all stripes, Muslims, Hindus. This world is a giant chaotic mess because of the twisting and the cunning of the enemy. It still works. He pulled it off on our incredible, beautiful most intelligent, most capable Mother Eve, and it still works. So let's expose him a bit. First of all, again, keep in mind that the devil hates, I'm going to call it, he hates Jesus's Bible <laughs> because that's all Jesus had. That's what was there. It was the Old Testament. So no wonder he still hates it. And he calls the Old Testament the Old Covenant. And he says it was all done away with at the cross. And the Old Testament was just for the Jews. And there's the God of the Old Testament is just angry. And he's different from the loving God of the New Testament. And we're no longer under the law of the Old Testament. We're now under the grace of the New Testament. So no, we don't need to pay any attention to the Old Testament. We're now New Testament Christians. Now these are all the twistings and the cunning deceptions that he uses and much much more. He doesn't want us paying attention to the New Testament, make no mistake, but he really slyly attacks the Old Testament, and there's really good reason. We're going to see it tonight. Um, we showed this slide before because all of the Bible, both of the Testaments, lift up a common message, even better, a common person, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 5, 
the scriptures bear witness about me. God spoke in many various ways through the prophets, but the goal was to uphold the Son of God. That's found in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. And we see it there unfolded. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. And it's at the cross, the ultimate speech from God was what we're, we're told. And the speech was simply this. Jeremiah 31 grabs it. This is the covenant I'm going to make with all the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in your minds, write it on your hearts. I will be your God. You will be my people. That's the message we're going to dive into tonight. Exactly the nuts and the bolts of how Jesus does this, becoming our God, we his people, and putting this personal relationship into place. Um, when the Bible calls it the everlasting covenant, we find it mentioned in Genesis 17, verse 7. This everlasting covenant he will establish uh, between him and us, all generations, from, the, from that point until eternity begins. Well, tonight, as we've said, we're going to look at the Old Testament 365 Messianic prophecies are found there that define the plan of redemption for mankind and tells the incredible details of how God would rescue us from sin. Exactly how, when, and who he's going to sin, and even the complete why that only God could rescue us. Well, Here's the first messianic prophecy, and this is the only one we're going to look at tonight. Genesis 3, 15, even one part, the first part. Uh, scholars and theologians, when they're talking about certain parts of a verse, will often use the little A or B, or even C if there's three parts. So we're just looking at Genesis 3, 15, A, a little theologian's way of saying we're just going to look at the first teaching of that verse. Well, what we find is that immediately after the fall of man, God promised a savior. He promised a way out. Let's look at it. It's found in Genesis 3.15, right at the beginning, where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Let's stop. Guess who's he addressing this to? The you is the devil. That's the, the, the snake, the serpent, the devil. Satan, I am going to, this is God speaking, I am going to establish enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. He, capital he, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Cindy and I talked about this verse some this week as we were thinking and praying together. What an incredible prophecy. What an incredible prophecy massive statement from God in heaven as the result of the first sin, the original sin, the fall from by Adam and Eve. It tells me so much here. There's so much. But first, let's look over at the New Testament fulfillment. You find it in Luke 1 35. The angel answered and said to her, this is Mary. It's interesting. So I've got Eve, listening on Genesis 3, Mary, the mother of Jesus, listening on Luke 1. Wow, what a beautiful connectedness of the moms. And the angel answered and said to her, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you, and therefore also that Holy One who is to be born 
will be called the Son of God. We're going to look a lot more at that here in a moment. But I just wanted to set this up as this incredible Old Testament prophecy of Jesus to come, this seed, capital S, that's going to bruise your head, Satan. You will bruise his heel. And Jesus got assassinated. But the end of Satan and evil was announced in Genesis 3.15. Wow. Wow. With great strength, God spoke. And this battle between good and evil has raged ever since. And Mary was there and heard her role as she became the recipient of the divine seed from the Holy Spirit. We're going to unpack that more tonight. The virgin birth is incredibly important to your and my salvation. Let's look at a little more New Testament fulfillment here. Uh, I don't want to have to be the voice that reads everything. So um, if any of you want to come off of mute, uh, or I guess I could just even ask, uh, Vicki, would you mind doing Matthew 1? And then uh, Pat, if you would do First John 3, and Jackie, Hebrews 2. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my, 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 my. Joseph, this incredible righteous man. Notice this genealogy, this beautiful birth story of Jesus. We've heard it since we were kids. But notice how the Lord comes and intervenes and he calls him exactly who he is. Joseph, son of David. Jesus, Jesus was coming from the line of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary because she has conceived supernaturally, miraculously by the Holy Spirit. Unbelievably important. All right. First John three, Pat. <clears throat> He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So here, this text picks up that enmity theme that God himself proclaimed right there, right after the fall, as he addressed the main perpetrator, the devil himself, he said in this text, anyone who follows him, the devil has sinned from the beginning. But here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus to destroy the works of the devil. This is the, this is the battle royale prophesied in Genesis 3 being unfolded. And then Jackie Hebrews 2. 14 and 15, correct? Okay. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So much said in this beautiful text. But notice all of us as children of Adam and Eve, partakers of flesh and blood, we we have, as it were, the death sentence upon us all. And that's exactly what God had told them. Which, again, back to that first lie from the enemy. You're not really going to die. But death has happened to everyone. Death has reigned across this earth. All have sinned. All pay for it with death. But notice that through the fear of death, people are in lifetime bondage, but here comes Jesus. 
likewise sharing in the same that through death he might destroy the enemy's power. So here we go. Here's this battle cry, battle language, enmity. And Jesus steps into the middle of this whole big sin problem, exactly as was prophesied in Genesis 3. Exactly. Have you ever stopped to even try to think of what they gave up? Of what it could even possibly be like to be in Eden in the paradise of God. I mean, artists like this on the right, that's a Kincaid painting on the right, Thomas Kincaid. Don't remember who on the left. But, you know, you could just take hours almost and study some of these paintings and then let your imagination run and try to imagine physically just being there, sharing, living in the very presence of the creator the energy, the enlightenment, the excitement, the preciousness of it, the intimacy of it all, eclipsing anything any of us have ever even conceived of. Any of our best moments here on earth, and we've all had some grand moments. Pat and Margaret just had wonderful, beautiful moments over in Ireland. And we've all had precious moments trips and vacations and family reunions and births of children and all oh, just all kinds of wonderful things that have happened in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Not any of it even gets close to what God had originally intended and to the preciousness of Eden. It, however you want to approach it, if you want to talk about the environment, if you want to talk about, oh, I don't know, a perfect temperature, a, a, an absolutely pristine water, skies, air, we've known, none of us have ever seen it, breathed it, drank it, what it was like in Eden. We don't have a clue. One of my favorite waters is Fiji water. It's expensive. I don't know why. It tastes so, so, so good. It tastes, you know, like what I would sort of think Eden water might have tasted like. And I guarantee you, if you had some Eden water and some Fiji water, the Fiji water, you'd be pouring it out. It's that bad. And we've all had like nasty sulfur water. I don't know, maybe in the Florida Keys or New Orleans or someplace where it seems like the water's just, oh. You take a drink of it there in Florida and you just, oh, good water. nasty. The water in Eden, unbelievable. That's where they had been. That's what God had created. The beautiful majesty, the total peace, the tranquility, even that. We started our conversation tonight talking about how you know, uh, with Margot in her beautiful ministry with kids that God has given her, it's stressful. It takes a lot. And it's tough. And she comes home and on the weekends and she just wants to kind of just collapse and rebuild and re-plug in and so forth. Well, imagine, imagine Eden where there was never even a decay in strength or endurance or anything. Unbelievable what was lost. And because God had created it perfect, and because God had such incredible eternal love, unquenchable love for us, he was determined to get us back there. That's the story. How to get us back to Eden. How to get us back to the paradise lost. And the story is captured in Revelation 13, 8 of all places at the end of the Bible. It talks about how the God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had planned 
from before the, from the foundation of the world, before Eden, Jesus had a rescue plan just in case. He's called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That to me is mind blowingly special and gives me eternal hope that his plan is going to work for you and for me because this plan got laid way back. And it's a plan of redemption from eternity past that you find begin to be unfolded in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God knew what was going to happen in his great foreknowledge. He knew what had happened up in heaven with the rebellion and the fall. He had cast the devil out of heaven, and the devil found his place down here on earth to try to disrupt God's continuing creation. So in Genesis 3.15, we're finding what we would call the theme of the great controversy between good and evil. And just to, just to point out a few things, this enmity business, but notice he shall bruise your head, Satan. Well, you know, the head is the most vulnerable part. And the head, that tells me it's fatal. That the Jesus will deal a fatal blow to Satan. And as Adam and Eve stood there listening to these incredible words of God to the devil, it gave them hope. It gave them a sense of he's on our side. He's going to rescue us. There's a plan for, for us. Because the Lord is going to take care of him. Now there's going to be bruising both ways. There'll be bruising of his heel. And sure enough, Jesus paid the ultimate price. Now it's I find it interesting that most of us hate snakes to this very day. This enmity God pronounced between us and snakes, it just seems to be, it's universal. And I've also was just thinking about it, you know, that picture there from the artist of Jesus stepping on the head of the snake. And that's pretty much what you have to do to immobilize a snake today. Is you got to grab it as quick as you can right behind its head. And if you want to kill it, you're going to have to decapitate it. That's how you take care of a snake and defeat it to this day. Let's remember that as we go forward. What a picture there an artist grabbed of Adam holding Eve's hand and they're listening to Jesus tell them, I'm going to, I'm going to step into this. I got him. I'm going to kill him. You stick with me. And it will be through your seed. Wow. Can you imagine the day, the time that they got escorted out of the garden? And it was a death sentence. And the devil had lied to them. No, you're not really going to die. And I'm sure Adam and Eve said to Jesus, is that really true? And Jesus said, yeah, it's true. The wages of sin is death. Romans 5 says it this way. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all of us have sinned. Every one of us. It's a death sentence without Jesus. And that's one of the main things I would want to take into my heart tonight, that it's a death sentence unless you've got Jesus. It's really interesting. The Bible teaches that life is in the blood. Um, Margo, can you read that for us there, both Leviticus and Hebrews? You bet. Uh, Leviticus says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. 
but it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And Hebrews says, all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay, so that's a clear Bible teaching that the life is in the blood, blood had to be shed. So here's something's very interesting. I want us to want us to think about. Um, the Hebrews understood this. Maybe today it's not so understood, but it's actually scientifically the, the case and should be understood. So for the Hebrews, they understood that really it was through the Father that sin got transmitted to the baby. Interesting. Not so much through the mother, but through the father, which you, is one reason you'll find, you know, from the uh, uh, that from the fathers to the father's father, and for generations, guilt and so forth. They always mention the father. Well, there's some reasons behind that. And today, medical science confirms that a fetus does not receive its blood supply from the mother, but from the father. So an ovum begins to produce its own blood supply immediately after the father's sperm penetrates the egg held in the body of the mother. But until that conception takes place uh the unfertilized ovum doesn't start making its own blood supply it takes the father to start the blood supply being made the life of the flesh is in the blood it's really interesting how the sin according to the bible gets transferred from the father not from the mother therefore it's no surprise that in the plan of salvation for Jesus to come and intervene in this sinful world, he had to come from the Holy Spirit. Couldn't be from another sinful man creating a sinful blood in him. Interesting. Um, and Romans 5 says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. So the life is in the blood, the need of a savior from Eden on. Here's the most famous Bible verse ever. And I always like to pair it with verse 17, frankly. Um for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him will not perish but have an everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The blood of Jesus, the perfect life, the perfect character, the perfect blood. Remember, he was a lamb without spot or blemish. His blood, as it were, came from the Holy Spirit. And he was able to cover our sins because he was perfect. An imperfect human being, no matter how good they were, could never cover your or my sins. It's not possible. It is not possible. The enmity that God placed was going to be between his son and the enemy. And that's where the battle was going to be fought. And Jesus himself was going to have to save us from our sins. The virgin birth was really an absolute necessity. Here's some scriptures that help us understand that. Um, how about, Vicki, if you could do Isaiah 7 and uh, Lori, I don't know if you can hear us okay, but if you can, I'd love to have you do Matthew 1, 20 and through 22. Yeah. All right, 
Vicki, if you could do the man, uh, Isaiah 7. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we remember the name Emmanuel, right? God with us is what Emmanuel means. The Lord himself giving a sign, the virgin conceives. And this is the text between your seed and her seed. I absolutely love this painting. And if I can ever find it, I'm going to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, of a, an artist rendering of Mary, the mother, holding her precious son, Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit and also a lamb at the same time. What a powerful image is that? Uh, Lori, take us through Matthew 1 there. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He will give birth to your son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because that will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to your son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Here's the beautiful connection of Isaiah and Matthew, both of these prophecies fulfilling that original statement from God himself. I'm going to have my seed that's going to come and intervene and defeat and win. There are, according to the scripture, seven steps back to paradise lost. And I love this. I love that it's the fact that it's the number seven, which is interesting. We'll learn more about that when John Earnhardt has the Revelation series in uh, November, about a month and a half here in Gold Hill at the church. Uh, but let's take a look. Now, this is going to have us, let's get our Bibles <clears throat> and let's just look at each of these texts, okay? Because it's so important. And if you want to jot these down, these are beautiful promise texts that we can use to make sure we can share with others, but also ourselves be on the seven steps back to paradise lost. Step number one is simply awareness of your, my sins. Uh, Jackie, would you look up Romans three and then Vicki, I'll have you do Romans 10 and then Pat, Margo, you could do the third one there, First John, and then Lori, Luke 6, and then we'll start over. Romans 3. You got it? I don't, I can't see because I've got it up on full screen. So you may have to make sure you're off of mute. I've got it if you want me to read it. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead, Judy. I can't see what. On my okay, screen. it's uh, Romans 3, 23. It says, yes. for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Thank you. All have sinned. Thank you. All have sinned. Never leaves anybody out. There's so many texts we could use. That one gets right to the point. Back to our original discussion. Loves us too much to not tell us the truth. Truth is, I have sinned. I'm aware. I need something. So awareness is step number one. All right. How about Romans 10? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Does that leave any doubt? Boom, there it is. If you confess, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. He has not made this difficult. I love him for that. That's step number two. I'm aware. 
and I confess I'm sincerely sorry and I repent. All right, uh, Pat and Margo, how about First John for step number three? This, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours alone, but also for the whole world. Wow. And for yes. Him, First John 5, 12 says, he who has the son of life, he who does not have the son of life does not. Wait, I feel like I skipped a line. My apologies. I'm going to read that again. Okay. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Aren't you glad he's made it so just plain and clear? He has been, he has paid for our sins, as Pat read, mm -hmm. mine personally, yours personally. And then he says, for the whole world, absolutely the entire world got paid for by Jesus. And whoever has Jesus inside in a relationship, you guaranteed you've got life. Oh my, I just love it. It overcomes me every time I hear that powerful truth. Step number four, Luke six. Then why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Okay, Luke six, 46. I'm just making sure what I did. Yes. Okay, that's right. And do not do what I say. So it's clear when we choose to follow Jesus, then there's an obligation, of course, to keep following him. Jesus said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. So it's for a whole life that we follow him. And he says that means doing what he says. All right. Well, we all recognize step number five because every one of us continues to struggle and Jesus knew that was going to be true it was true for Adam and Eve I mean can you have you ever thought of this we all know what the first sin of Eve was we all know what the first sin of Adam was they had a second and a third and it went on right the Bible tells us what God does about that uh first John 1 9 uh, Judy, you want to go for that? Yes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That leaves no questions. Mm -hmm. And God intentionally chose some legal words there. Righteous, just to forgive us. That means it's okay. He says it's okay. And he is the judge. Therefore, forgiveness is legally correct. So if we confess them as when other sins occur, confess, repent, let God continue to clean our lives out. That's what he's looking for. He knows that's going to, he knows step five's there for every one of us. Every one of us. Nobody lives perfect. Number six, um, Jackie, can you see that? Yes. First John okay. um, 3, 3. Yep. And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself even as he is pure. Isn't that wonderful? The hope is the blessed hope that Jesus is going to be coming back. And notice, because that's the context of 1 John 3, is the coming of Christ. He's not going to leave us. He wants us with him. He wants us back in paradise. And notice what it says, that you will become purified as you look for constantly expecting Jesus to return. I'm going to read um, Luke 12, 42 through 44. have gotten the wrong text. Now, I meant to go a little bit before that, and that is 35. Be dressed in readiness, keep your lamps alight, 
be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast. Uh, and then it says, verse 40, be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So I got the wrong verses in there. Uh, but it's still in Luke 12. So living in a constant expectation that Jesus is going to return for you, for me, that's actually part of the being, stepping back towards paradise, living ready, living ready for Jesus, uh, having the constant expectation. There are people that kind of ridicule that. They say, well, you know, he hasn't come. Where is the promise of his coming? The Bible addresses that. And says that that we're supposed to live ready, be constantly expecting, and that the world's going to be like that, where they're going to question it, just like they did with Noah when he goes inside the ark. They laughed at him. They made fun of him for being inside the ark for seven days until the rain started. And then the last step, uh, let's see, how about... Pat and Margo, can you do that one for us? There's no such a thing as Luke chapter 28. There's not? No. no I think some of my numbers got transposed. Yeah. I've been uh, a couple different verses, but they don't line up yet. So maybe it's. Yeah, eight. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was doing some copying and I think I got it. Uh, I think I got the wrong things right there. I mean, look, I think where I was meaning to be, yeah, so it's actually Matthew chapter 28, not Luke, Matthew 28, if you want to do 19 and 20. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the world age. Thank you so much. Amen. Um, that's, that's the great gospel commission. And it rests on every single one of us, not the paid clergy, not the paid pastors. In the New, in the New Testament church, when Jesus left, he didn't leave, leave paid pastors in charge. That's something that came in later. He actually gave the commission to every single one of his believers. So that Margot, sharing with those kids at school, she is fulfilling the gospel commission. Every one of us, as we share Jesus with a smile, with a hug, with a silent prayer for the waitress, whatever we are doing for him, that's the gospel commission. And it's with us for the rest of our lives. Praise the Lord. All right. Let me see if John 4, if I quit making my mistakes. I, th I think it's right. Yeah, it's right. That one's right. Go ahead, Margo. Uh, it says, do you do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. All right. Yes, that's exactly the one I, I wanted us to look at. Because as we were talking earlier as a as a group, we were saying things like, and we all agree, we've never seen the world like this. This world's getting worse. It's not better. The rottenness, the, the, the chaos, the crime is worse and worse. We could go, we could talk for hours about it. It's shocking, stunning. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. How is it any different? Jesus knew it would get just like it is right now. And that's why there's that text in John 4.35. Because we shouldn't be saying, well, there's time. I think there's time. There's... He's like, no, no, no. Everywhere you look, it's white. It's ready for harvest. I think we should just absolutely work.
for Jesus full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Every chance, every opportunity we get, we have no idea what it's doing for others. I think back to Jackie's story about this uh, this young boy that remembers they the things we tell people and say to people in Jesus' name, it makes an eternal difference. So there's our seven steps back to paradise lost. Uh, I love it. That's the way Jesus has for us. And this is literally living out the covenant, the new covenant that he makes where he puts his character, his own loving law, his own spirit of love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, the fruits of the spirit in our minds, writes it across our hearts and becomes a very personal God. And we are his people and we're family together. Aren't you glad we have these scriptures that are inspired without errors, authoritative, they are sufficient. Jesus said, I'm giving you my word. I will come again. Well, next week, we're going to continue building this relationship. And next week's topic is a takeoff from tonight. We looked at one messianic prophecy, but next week is like solid gold because it's Jesus, the focus of all scripture. There will be some powerful new teaching next week from all kinds of places in the Bible. I want you to see Jesus throughout the scripture, even in what you might think would be almost some boring parts of scripture, like the book of Numbers, Le Leviticus, the genealogy of Matthew. I mean, really? Jesus is woven into every single page, and it's profound when you get the key in your hand to unlock and see Jesus there. So we'll do that next week. Looking forward to it. Anybody have any points or questions or comments before we pray? I do. I actually found it interesting when you read that last slide, the Jeremiah 31, 33. I found it interesting because it says, I will put my law in their mind. And when you were talking when you said my law you listed the fruits of the spirit and and it was just kind of like a moment there I went and we always think of the law as being like rigid 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 and and it was just kind of like a little aha moment for me to go the law are the fruits of the spirit was it that was just interesting I guess Yep, exactly. That's his character. <laughs>